the framing argument, is this about to roll off? <laughs> I just noticed. I was of my eye. I'm going to move it a bit back because otherwise I tend to be rather, and I, wow, that would be something. Very good, much safer. Um, so my, my framing argument is the following. And I'm going to take you through a little trip, meandering trip. But the framing argument is that today is an epoch, the last, I would say, the last 20 years, where ideologically speaking, there is an incredible renationalizing of the understanding of membership, who belongs. Structurally speaking, a majority of citizens might as well be outsiders. They are losing ground in our rich countries. Germany is very special, I must say. But if you look very carefully at the statistics, even in Germany, the sons and daughters of the middle classes are on the other side of the curve. For generations, also in, in most of our Western countries, the sons and daughters did better than their parents. And now for the first time, it's very extreme in some countries, the United States, Greece, Spain, less extreme in a country like Germany. The point that I'm trying to make is that the question of membership needs to bring into the picture not only the ideological domain, but also the structural infrastructure, if you want, the infrastructure of membership, where I argue more and more citizens are losing membership rights. Hence, solidarities should be transversal with migrants, with refugees, rather than seeing them as causing the losses. And if you look at the statistics, or let, let me just use a more generic image, when I ask the question, in our countries, in our Western countries, but really also Russia, also some countries that we may not think of as Western. In our Western countries, if I ask the question, who is gaining rights? It is not citizens, nor is it immigrants. It is corporations. It's financial firms. They have gained membership rights at a level, at a rate, that is quite extraordinary. And, you know, it's more acute in some countries than in others. Again, Germany is really a bit different, radically different from the United States. But also here, they have gained rights. So I think it's a very tough, bad time for the question of membership. And hence, part of my argument is that we need to rethink the politics of membership. And we need to do that, I'm a social scientist, with, you know, well-informed pieces of information, analytic tools, et cetera, et cetera. Now, oopsie, when I, um, when I do the kind of research I do, which is a bit transversal, and just since uh, many of you may not know me at all here, uh, I am you know, a serious academic, as we might say, but, uh, but I just want to emphasize my transversality, okay, so that we are sort of maybe, and so my first book, The Mobility of Labor and Capital, was rejected by 12 publishers. That gives you an idea. The 13th, and now it's considered a classic, you see. So that just gives you an idea. And I have a few other stories like that. You know that it, it, I have had an interesting trajectory. I have stuck to my guns. I don't like that phrase, actually. I have stuck to my idea, sounds better than guns. And, and I have paid a price for it, but I think, you know, in the long run, same thing with The Global City. That was a very controversial book. So when I do my kind of research, I need a space that I call the space before method. Method, when you do research in the social sciences, is a disciplining condition. It tells you what is legitimate research, how you do it, and why you're doing it. Sooner or later, I also have to move vaguely in that zone. But to do my research, my interpretation, my trying to understand, sorting out what is happening, 
I cannot immediately enter. So I call that the zone before method. Now, I want to invoke Kafka. Uh, we're in Europe, so Ka Kafka has this beautiful image of before the law. Before the law kicks in is a zone where there is either terror, what will the law do to me, or there is what I call epistemic indignation, which is a kind of mental violence. When I hear the neoliberal explanation of what is happening, I feel mental violence is done to me. So I just want to emphasize that I dwell in that before method moment in the zone of epistemic indignation. I do not accept a lot of the explanations. I'm especially in, in, in the political economy. So the, that what I engage in then are analytic tactics. The freedom to position myself vis-a-vis -vis the object of study in whatever way I want or need, which very often then produces understandings and findings that are different from the mainstream story. And a lot of my presentation has to do with that kind of approach. Now, there are three sort of, of these analytic tactics that I want to uh, use without you know, mentioning them, but so that you know. One of them is this notion of the importance, when you're trying to understand what is happening, of destabilizing stable meanings. Now, I mean big meanings, what we might call categories for analysis. So when I say immigration, if I want to study, understand something about immigration, and I use the term immigration, which I think is a beautiful word, I have said so much already that it is almost an invitation not to think, not to ask, well, what are we talking about when we are saying immigration, the immigrant? So that is a bit the, the position, if you want. And I do that with all kinds of things. When we say urbanization, what are we talking about? Well, we're also talking about people being expelled because 220 million hectares of land have been bought in the last five years alone. And they're being thrown out of their little farms and thrown out of their land. Where do they go? They go to cities. So when I say urbanization, I cannot simply say city. I have to bring in something else. The same thing with immigration. I want to go back to the basics. Who is she, the immigrant? But also, who is she, the citizen, in today's world? Now, the second one is connected to the first. And that is really, what, what do we see? What do we find in the shadows of the bright light that a very powerful, dominant explanation makes a lot, I mean, one image that I like to use is dark street at night, sharp light, circle of light. The stronger that light, i.e. the stronger the explanation, the more I can see everything in that circle of light. But the more difficult to understand what is in the shadows immediately around that circle of light. So when we say immigration today, we have a whole series of elements that we use to mark the immigrant. When we say citizen, we do that. What are we not seeing when we invoke these very powerful categories? My site, my place, my zone for research and for theorization is in the shadows around powerful explanations. I don't reject the powerful explanation. But I want to know, because it is so powerful, precisely because it is so powerful, what does it keep me from seeing? The third one, which I don't think I will get to, but I'm so glad you mentioned, because I think this is a very important, uh, is, is a question of territory. And I think that we have sort of allowed this very powerful category, territorium, ich glaube auf Deutsch ist das ja auch, because in English I like to say territory is not ground, not land, not space. Territory is a very complex category 
with embedded logics of power and embedded logics of claim making. When those peasants were being expelled from their land in quite a few parts of the world, they, they, they are not simply expelled from their land, they are expelled from a territory that is embedded with histories of meaning, geographies of work and production, etc., etc. So in today's world, where you have these, what I think of as geographies of centrality that install themselves in all our countries with such ease, that belong to very rich and powerful actors who don't even need to be citizens to be wherever they want to be, uh, I think that territory, the notion of national territory, is something that is getting disassembled, which then also comes back to this notion, who are we, the citizens, your average citizen? And who is she, the immigrant? I mean, I see a lot of unsettlement. Now, I want to repeat again, I like to focus on the extreme condition not on the middle. So what I'm talking about is really an extreme edge. The assumption is that a focus on the extreme condition is heuristic. It produces knowledge about more than itself. So that is a bit uh, the idea. Now, I just want to illustrate, and I will be using a lot of the, the issues around immigration, but I want to sort of destabilize the category remittances as an illustration of sort of a beginning analytics of how do we reposition who is she, the immigrant. And as I say here, you know, it's, it, when you say remittances, you're invoking a category. It is chock full of meaning today given a very ideological context, very often what is added is, ah, so here come these immigrants from low-wage countries, and what do they do? They work here, and the money they make here, they send it back home, right? As a kind of, look how bad. This is just, you know, no good. Now, in the United States, this is very strong. In some countries, this is stronger than in others. But I took a little sidestep, again, my analytic tactics, and I asked, not the typical question that is asked, the typical question is, the immigrants who are in my country, where do they send their money back? And usually it's a focus on low-wage sort of working immigrants, not on foreign professionals. And then you see a list of poor countries, so-called poor countries. I took a little sidestep, and I changed the question just a bit. And I asked, who are the main remittance receiving countries. So that's an analytic tactic. And so here is what you see, and this is right before the crisis. In the top 10, there are five rich countries. So the UK, for instance, where the UK and the UK, they always feel invaded by Poland. Well, guess what? The UK gets more <laughs> remittances than Poland. Of course, it's professionals, right? And if you look at the top 20, the United States, which I find absolutely adorable, the United States is also in the top 20. So that tells you something about a whole other world of remittances that involves foreign professionals. One question I have, I don't want to answer that question here, but what happens to the category immigration and to the category remittances when we bring in this kind of information? that professionals, these, these countries are clearly as professionals. In case of Europe, of course, it's also neighboring countries, etc. But how do we begin to destabilize this sort of often very negative meaning that is associated with immigration once we do this kind of work? Now, how about destabilizing the immigrant subject? And again, I repeat the question I asked before. When I say immigration, what am I not seeing? What are some of these issues? And one issue is that all immigrants are citizens. They're all citizens, not of the same country. 
So when I say immigration, I'm just wiping that out. And out of that comes, for instance, in the United States, a very easy notion that you can treat them, not just like illegal immigrants, but like illegal human beings almost. I mean, where it's a very fine line. So, and, and second point I might, I might want to add, since 1994, when the whole world trade, uh, the WTO negotiations are sort of settled, we have had a subject that is a carrier of rights that are portable rights. And that, that's firms who employ workers under the treaty, WTO treaty law. They have this kind, they produce that kind of subject. A worker whose rights are valid in all signatory countries. Why can't we do that with at least some, a portion of the, the global immigrant workforce? We could. We've done it. The, and I mention that because the debate usually is that rights, as in the robust rights that a citizen has or is meant to have, uh, are connected to national states. Mostly they are, it's true. But we have, when we wanted, when the chips were down and you had powerful actors like multinational corporations, they got what they wanted. They got a subject with portable rights. And they are rather significant rights. They are robust rights, as they say in the, in the law. They are term rights. They don't go on forever. But, you know, there are a lot of countries, 180-plus countries, which recognize those rights. Now, when you put together all immigrants are citizens of some country, and you put together the fact that we have produced a subject with formal, recognized, portable rights in most countries of the world, for me, I see an agenda for work. It will take work. The WTO negotiations took years. But it can be done. And that would be one way. It doesn't mean that you have to receive everybody forever. No. It just means that you recognize that the immigrant is a citizen. And the rights that the citizen carries in her home country cannot just simply be thrown out of the window as, they did, as if they didn't exist. Um, now, when I try to understand who is the immigrant... I cannot start with the notion that, ah, yeah, the immigrant is the immigrant. It doesn't work for me. So I, one strategy that I have used is immigration spaces. These immigration spaces are made through a variety of instruments, legal instruments, practical issues, the preferences of firms, the character of an economy, what jobs need to be filled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they capture a moment, you know, a slice in a given society, in a given time. They will vary. They register the transformations. We're right, think of Europe. After World War II, the immigration spaces were characterized. There was a demand for agricultural workers, for construction workers, for factory workers, and there was a kind of formalizing of those spaces. So the immigrant varied, you know, in terms of a few spaces. Today, the range is much broader. So I include foreign professionals and all kinds of others. Uh, number two, when you look at it in terms of immigration spaces, you can also see that a given person is, number one, produced by that space, the subject vis-a-vis -vis the law or vis-a-vis -vis the culture of a place, the society, uh, is produced in a certain way. It's not just the subject herself. It is that space within which she moves. Now, at the same time, that given person can switch spaces. I arrived in the United States. I have mentioned that before, so I apologize if you have heard me say that already. But I arrived in the United States as an undocumented immigrant. You know, strictly speaking, illegal immigrant, whatever the language of the law. And, um, and I wound up, for me it was a bit of adventure, I confess. I was living in a very asphyxiatingly bourgeois setting in Rome, in Italy. Beautiful as it is, it didn't suit me. I was about 18 years old. I arrived with $50 in my pocket. My first job, 
in the United States was as a cleaning woman. The other members who, with whom I was working were mostly Caribbean, Afro-Caribbeans, and then some Colombians. All of us came from fairly good homes. I mean, economically speaking. Uh, none of us thought that was our destiny. That was the first step. So when you look at it that way, you understand that the immigrant subject is far less sort of substantive and content rich, and it's a designation, it's, and it travels across different worlds. So again, it's a way of disaggregating the solidity of the immigrant. Now, I don't know, in, in Germany, the immigrant, sagt man das? The, I don't know, but the way we use it in, in the English language, whether that's the UK or the United States, is as the immigrant, you know, which is sort of, a, it, it essentializes a bit. The immigrant is not the citizen. Whereas what this does, it sort of intermediates a bit. Now, at the same time, who is the immigrant subject? I have a very long list here, but there is a lot to be said about each one of these, but I don't want to, to talk about that now. But again, the notion is, Many different. Now, I'm sure that some of you have had that experience, but when I'm in, I, I don't do that now anymore. I used to do it because by now it's all known, but uh, when I was in certain very, very formal settings, um, I would, foreign settings, I would, when they would ask me, what, what do you do or whatever, but I was often the guest of honor, so it was like a polytest question. I would say, I'm an immigrant worker. Now, these were very high sort of settings. And they would say, no, 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 no. You are a foreign professional in the United States, sort of correcting me. And I would say, well, excuse me, but an immigrant worker, a foreign professional is an immigrant worker. So, again, to destabilize, you know, this solid subject. The, the, the... Now, I now want to do a similar job on the citizen. I want to destabilize. The citizen subject. Now here I'm very much influenced by certain countries more than others. Again, Germany, especially since World War II, has had a very interesting story. I mean, you all know, or those of you who are German, that at some point you had one of the most liberal asylum laws, etc., which the other EU countries forced you to change to get to the norm of the continent, you know. But this is so this is a bit this holds mostly for the United States in a very narrow sense, but there are elements that also hold here. So in, what, what I'm trying to do here is in a way something similar to what I did with, with the immigrant subject. And so what, is, what stands out, and, it, and that to me matters in a historic sense and also in terms of today, is that while the citizen is a highly formalized subject, it is continuously capable of reinventing itself. That's very important. Now, uh, I think that, that when, when, I, when I do my research, <coughs> I cannot say the citizen, as I said, for the, the citizen. So I, I try to understand this very complex institution you know, that takes so many different forms around the world. And analytically, then, I think of citizenship as an incompletely theorized contract between the state and a people, or a state's people, subjects, whatever, the citizens, right? So in that incompleteness lies this possibility of reinventing. So there have been times when we have accumulated rights, we citizens, and then there have been times when we have lost rights. And today, we're losing rights. Not, not just minority citizens, no, all of us, we're losing rights. For some people, for certain elites, it doesn't matter. For some, it does matter. In the United States, I have a little hobby, which is counting the rights we lose, you know, documenting the rights. It's very hard work. But I've been doing this for a very long time. And there are a lot of technical rights. That, and the United States is probably particularly brutal in this sense. You know, the United States is a certain kind of country. My husband, for instance, doesn't want to live there anymore. He's an American. But the whole American family, my son, also American, they have left the United States, because they think the United States is already a fascist country, you know, whatever that. But um, I think it's a turnkey fascist country, you know what I mean, like a turnkey factory. Every, all pieces are in place, but it isn't quite there. But, you know, 
you could just turn the key and poof, there it would be, with all the surveillance apparatus and all of that. But, um, but so, so in the law, there is no such subject as the citizen. Like a Christmas tree where each right is a bubble, you know? So if three disappear, you say, wow, look at that. No, th th that subject doesn't exist. What it is is we are a condition distributed across multiple highly specialized technical domains. And it takes a lot of work to establish what all rights we have, what rights we gain, what rights we lose. Now, for me, this issue of the citizen losing rights is not, the purpose is not to complain. The purpose is to produce, to make visible a structural condition that suggests that our transversal solidarities are the ones that count today. With our state, we need to engage, we need to fight, etc. We need to make claims, we need to try to make change. But there is a fact of transversalities that often disappears, especially in this very ideological period. Now, I also find, find interesting the third point here, this constitutionalizing of the right to sue the state, which in the United States is part of the origins. But in Europe, no. You acquired that right you know, some countries 30 years ago, some countries a bit less. And that's a time, actually, when, when citizens are really, also in the United States, citizens are gaining rights. It's a very interesting period, the period before the 1980s, in a way. It's an interesting time. It's after World War II, so it's, it's a, spe a special kind of conjuncture. Now, clearly, then, ultimately, the human, human rights, the body as a site, you know, that is a fantastically transversal, weak regime, but we now know it's here to stay. We may not always have known that it was here to stay, but now we do know. Now, I want to do the same with the undocumented immigrant. But here the analytic operation is actually the obverse from the citizen, or the immigrant for that matter, in the sense that, in principle, formally speaking, there is no such subject. It's a subject that doesn't exist. That subject only appears when a violation is established. Then the law punishes or forgives, but then, that, then the body, if you want, of the undocumented becomes the carrier of something that says, I exist. Now, to me, again, this is maybe not the moment or, or the occasion to develop that in depth, but that to me is very significant, that the act of violation produces a trail, a footprint, that eventually can also be the basis for a claim, a claim making. So we all know that when an amnesty is passed, if you have been violating the law of the country for only six months or for a year, you're out. If you have been violating the basic law of the country for a good solid 10 years, you are entitled to amnesty very often. I mean, this is how it works. So there is something about that encounter between a subject that does not exist until the law detects a violation and how to make that work. I mean, politic I'm a bit of a, also a political activist. To me, those are very interested, and I just mentioned that because it's a familiar condition, but there are many other such. So the undocumented immigrant from the perspective of a receiving country nowadays, is a very complex subject in a way. And, um, and there is also something about, you know, this whole issue of the politics of, of bodies, you know, how the body re-enters, the body as a provider of organs, the body as a mere provider of labor rather than a worker fully entitled, but also the body as the carrier of the law either as a violation or as a permission in the case of an undocumented immigrant. So anyhow, and, and in a way that works the opposite way of this whole practice, you know, to avoid non-refoulement laws, I'm sure you're all familiar, that the, the, you know, the high seas jurisdiction, do we know what we're talking about? The high seas jurisdiction being a jurisdiction where the state does not have to respect or abide by its own laws. 
anything goes. So we have these high seas jurisdictions in Charles de Gaulle Airport, in Heathrow Airport. I don't know if Frankfurt must have it as well. Uh, you know, and, and it's sort of when, when Snowden, Snowden, I mean, I, I remember I was on a, on, a BBC, on a BBC program with an expert on airports, but the shopping aspect and I don't know what all. And this person shall remain unnamed, terribly sympathetic. But his image was that Snowden was basically shop in a shopping mall. You know, he was criticizing, but it wasn't that way. You know, there is it because it is it is also in in Heathrow or in Kennedy. You know, I have paid attention. You know what it, it is like. This is little this little hallway. Very often, it's just a little hallway. You know, that means that you are not processed. You are not. That happened just now with this. Um, Miranda, of all possible names, you know, his name was Miranda. Miranda, you know, being the right. <laughs> Anyhow, so, so it is like the, this is, and, and in, in the Mediterranean, the most familiar case you've all heard about it, is in the, in the Mediterranean, that little sea that feels like a little sort of puddle, huh? but there is an area in the middle if the ships coming from, no, from Europe can keep back the immigrant ships then, hey, the state is not obligated to anything. They might, be, they might be refugees, right? But hey, you don't have to recognize them. You ship them back. So that high seas jurisdiction is a tool that the states have developed because most states are signatories, you know, to the non refoulement, et cetera, all of that. But then they can avoid it. And so they have created it inside, inside airports, big airports, because the airport is, of course, the main point of arrival. So you can send back the immigrants you don't want. Uh, and you don't have to respect your own law. When this Miranda, the partner of Greenwald, et cetera, you know what I'm talking about, right? When he was detained in, the, in Heathrow, that was even more interesting because the state has passed a secret law that enables its agents, you know, in terms of the terrorism threat, all of that. That law then became visible because the British government applied that law, but in a zone where it had no business. It sets a precedent, by the way, but anyhow, it had no business applying that law because that, lie, that law does not apply in that space. I don't know if people are following me here, but to me this is terribly amusing, but it's also very dangerous, of course. So, so what we see is, is the will, and when you look at the financial system, you know, you see that all over the place, the will of the state to violate its own law, certainly the spirit of the law, but also on some more formal level. Now, anyhow, there is a lot more to be said here. So to me, one way of capturing where we are at is that it's sort of a move towards a kind of um, informal citizenship and effective nationality. Now, what I'm talking about here is long-term Residents, you know, they, their daily lives are the routines of your average citizen. They take their kids to school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, you know, in the United States, we have 11 million undocumented immigrants, and many of them are—they have been there for years. They they engage in the same routines as citizens. You know, often poor citizens, often not so poor citizens. But you know, so so. These are issues that destabilize the formalities of membership and potentially open up a conceptual but also a political space for re-arguing the question of membership. Uh, now, I wanted to, I'm looking, I have a clock in front of me. I can't quite remember when I started speaking. This happens all the time, but I'm trying to keep time. Uh, somebody else who I hope there is helping uh, now, more, more in terms of this connects to immigration via a notion uh, of, you know, a question really. To what extent are many immigrations today really expulsions, I mean, emigrations as expulsions? And not the migrations, you know, of the 1800s in search of a better life and all of that, but actually that people are being expelled and not by war, but where you can become a refugee, but more by economic, uh, economic practices. 
So, so, but my, I want to start with this notion of urbanization. You know, when we say the, the famous phrase that almost everybody uses, most people in the world today uh, uh, live in cities, the population of the world is getting urbanized, all of that. I'm so tired of hearing that. My question is, when we say urbanization, what are we not seeing? And one of the things we are not seeing, I'm just going to quickly go, is the fact of land grabs. I, I don't, I'm sure everybody knows that, but I want to point out this figure, which is a collective effort eh, to gather these figures, which is the fact that 220 million hectares of land have been bought since 2006, as far as a whole network of people engaging in measures can establish. That's quite a bit, actually. That's also beginning to happen in Europe, by the way, in the form of uh, preventing... Corporates are really getting into land, and they're preventing small farmers from buying land. I don't know if people are aware of this. This is something that has just kicked in in Europe because corporate agriculture is a source of money. It's getting commodified. It's getting financialized. So, you know, there are multiple levels. Now, so in, then comes this notion of emigration as expulsion. I very quickly wanted to, to uh, illustrate, you know, just, again, very, very fast, when China, not to hit on China, because South Korea, Sweden, you know, all kinds of countries are doing it. <coughs> when China buys... 2.8 million hectares of land in Congo to make a plantation for palm. What happens? Massive expulsion of faunas, floras, villages, rural manufacturing districts, people. Where do they go? They go to cities. So in that sense, really migration more as an expulsion. Here are some of the figures. Yes, Africa is still the main site but it is beginning to happen uh, in many places. And in, in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, it is now also very strong. Second point I want to, since this is Brot für alle, für die Welt, that the main people are always saying that, that it's mostly food crops, if only. It's mostly industrial crops, which means that you cannot eat what you're working on, which means that we now have hunger in areas of the world, but before you never had hunger. Like in parts of Argentina and parts of Brazil, you had poverty, but you didn't have hunger. In Brazil, people could eat those black beans. But now, if you plant soy or palm, you know, so these are all, and to call this emigration, when, it, when you see it at the receiving end, or immigration, is very problematic. Our own firms are producing that outcome that then is seen as undesirable people arriving. So the politics, I know that I don't have to persuade you. I'm just producing a narrative here that might be, that can be used. Um, now, I'm not going to, to deal with this very much, but I wanted to say more on this question of transversality. A particular financial, I'm going to do this very quickly, a particular financial instrument that was extremely destructive that was a financial project rather than a state project to enable modest people to have homes, uh, subprime mortgage, uh, which really has the same name as an original state project that worked very well, but this was a financial project, has been now declared illegal in the United States because it was so destructive. But it is happening here in Hungary, a million people out, etc. In Latvia, 360,000, you know. So... And here are the figures for the United States. Right now, 13 million households have been thrown out of their houses. I mention this in terms of the story of destabilizing what it means to be a citizen today, and hence to create a structure for transversal solidarities rather than seeing the other as a source of your problems. These are projects that are, come from finance, come from the state, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Now, 13 million people, by the way, I'm Dutch. This is 13 million households. 13 million households is up to 30 million people. In a brutal story that lasted five years, as the making of the process, and now by 2014 we know it's over, but it's still because of these contracts that are for five years, you, you don't pay a mortgage, etc. And it was not about providing a house. Eh? It was about providing a financial instrument that was backed by a material asset, a little house. Nothing to do with the value of the house, with whether they paid their mortgage or not, nothing. This is the creativity of finance. So very dangerous instrument. 
Because it doesn't matter whether you can pay or not. They give you five, all they want, sign, sign, sign. 15 million contracts were signed in five years. The agents needed 500 contracts signed every, you know, in a, in a period of a week. And it is a process that lasted several years, so 15 million contracts. 13 million, bad. Now that is up to 30 million people. We have 10 cities in the United States, thousands and thousands using the same tents as the international refugee. Nice municipal governments that put them out there on the outskirts. They are invisible. Who would go there? In all their materiality, they are invisible. Again, I say this in the spirit of this transversal, this infrastructure that even as we have renationalized the politics of membership, we should actually be doing the opposite, looking at the structural conditions that are happening. Um, again, in the case of the Netherlands, it's like throwing out the population of the Netherlands once, and then again. It's amazing. That makes it sort of Pythagorean. Um, now, I want to conclude in the same spirit and sort of reinvoke this notion of unstable meanings today. The unstable meaning of your average citizen. Again, Germany, you're so stable here that it's difficult to, if the, if the room is full of Germans, I don't know how you are. But both of the world is not quite that way. Um, and also the notion, what, what does it really mean to have membership in a nation state? I repeat, my effort is to to, to find sort of uh, the ground, the actual facts on the ground as to the citizen and the immigrant, which for a certain historic period was a constitutive difference. Uh, secondly, the point for me also is that when we look at that history, which from, for now, from, from our perspective today, looks so stable, what we can also see, and this is what I sort of... Uh, am after, this is one of my hypotheses in this book on guests and aliens that I brought here, which is our European history. What we see, and here Europe is the example, what we see is that when the outsider, we're talking about the 1800s and the 1900s in Europe, all kinds of archival material, mostly based on cities. As you know, the towns had good demographic. When the outsider succeeded in her claims of demanding incorporation. So my question was, what happens to the citizen? Is it really that what you gain, I lose? No. Their formal rights of citizens expanded. Let me give you a very simple example. When you're trying to set up a public transport system, in other words, a transport system that goes for everybody, uh, you cannot ask, are you legal, are you... No, it doesn't work that way. Everybody comes on. So when outsiders began, which were, remember the workers in the factories, they were often outsiders, also in Germany. Uh, they made claims for public housing, for public, uh, for public transport, for public education. Those claims translated, you know, there are comp complicated little histories in there, into an expansion of the rights for everybody. So bringing in the outsider, in that particular historic period, when the, if you want the systematicity at work, was one of bringing in and expanding, and that is broken today. That today is broken. Today, it just doesn't work that way anymore. Partly because everybody is losing, except you know some stratum up there of 20%. And some of us, of course, are part of that 20%, if you look at incomes, etc. but hopefully politically not. So, so, um, so I just wanted to, to then finish with an image of this map. And Germany has this too, by the way. Now, this is 10,000 buildings, huge structures. In other words, again, a materiality that is very visible, but they are, de facto they are invisible. It's like those 10 cities with homeless people in the U.S., and this is full-time surveillance. Now, surveillance is really a misnomer here. What it is is basically gathering. You have heard about it in the news. I have been talking about this since 2010. 
And people could not register it. You know, now, of course, we have all understood. It was very interesting for me to see what is simply undigestible information. And now it's digestible. But it basically is gathering all our data, you know, all our emails, everything is being gathered. And um, so, and it's, by the way, it's a, there is like, in the case of the United States, you know, but I should say that Germany has it. Eh? Germany has this surveillance system, the UK has it, France has it. This is de facto a transnational system. In, in research that I'm doing now, I'm looking at Germany, uh, the UK, the Netherlands, and the US. And that's just part of the story. There is more. So the surveyor, the surveying apparatus, is chock full of foreigners. It's private contractors. If your best algorithm builder is an Indonesian or a Russian, you get hired. So it's a very, and that's, I find that the most sympathetic part of that system, that it is rather denationalized. So here is the image that I want to leave you with. So, um, so here is 24 hours, you know, etc. vast amounts of money, eh? international surveillance apparatus, and then there is us. The basic logic of this system is that you are suspect. Otherwise, you know, why have all of that? So then the question is, and again in the spirit of transversalities, and who, how should we organize? The basic question is, who are we, the citizens, when we are prima facie, must be considered suspect. And so let's understand where our real solidarities should lie. Thank you very much. <laughs>